I am Josh Mandel here with the second episode of A Guided Walk Through Fire. Uh, and I should say we're doing a little bit of a random walk uh, at this point, really touching on topic areas that have represented uh, areas of questions or confusion in the last week. Uh, and, and we'll try to do an effort to tie these videos back to some discussions uh, on the chat.fire.org platform uh, where some of these topics have come up. And what I want to talk with you about today is uh, a subject that comes up in the Smart Application Launch Implementation Guide. So that lives at hl7.org slash fire slash smart app launch. Um, and what I wanted to dig into was access tokens. So I won't go over the basics of the Smart App Launch framework. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to do other videos that provide more of an overview on that front. But I want to narrow in on one particular uh, detail of the App Launch framework, which is a really important detail. Uh, and it's what's called the access token response, uh, and in particular the access token format. So overall, the Smart App Launch framework gives client applications a way to connect to uh, the data stored in some kind of electronic health record system or some kind of fire-enabled data access system. Uh, and so if you're an application developer, you build your app, it gets registered with the host data system, uh, and then the user or the user and an organization where that user works uh, together can provide access, can approve a request for your app to access data in a system. And so that process culminates in a step of this workflow, a step of this launch sequence, um, where the app asks the EHR or asks the fire server for access to certain data, the user can approve or deny, and then if the app is approved, it gets what's called an access token. Um, so we're going to focus on uh, this step here, really, which is the, the, the step that happens just at the end of the launch sequence after the app requests access. Uh, and once access is granted, we have what's called the, this authorization sequence. Um, and the idea here is there's an authorization request. The app gets back this value called an authorization code, which is not quite an access token yet, but it's the final thing the app needs before it can get an access token. Uh, so this code represents a value that the app can, can use to prove that it has been authorized. And then the app sends that code over to what's called the token endpoint of the authorization server, and the app gets back this access token. And finally, the access token is the piece that the app can use to fetch data or to interact with the Fire API. So what does that access token look like, and how can an app use it? And the important piece that I want to emphasize here is, uh, is something that we can see even pretty clearly through the example that comes in the Smart App Launch spec. So when we get to the stage of the spec that documents what's happening when the app gets that access token, well, it's passing along, it's issuing a request to the authorization server, passing along that authorization code, as well as some other details indicating uh, which app is requesting access and uh, making sure that this is bound to an existing session. And it gets back assuming everything's been successful, it gets back a set of parameters that will include an access token, a token type, and some scopes. So what are these all about? So really critically, the access token is the thing that the app is now going to use to make authorized requests to the endpoint. Uh, the token type in this application uh, launch implementation guide is a fixed value. It's always going to be what's called a bearer token. Uh, and these are by far the most common kinds of tokens used in OAuth 2. A uh, bearer token means anyone who holds the token can do or has authorization to do whatever the token says. Uh, you don't need to prove anything other than the fact that you know the access token. And that means that access tokens themselves are, are quite powerful and that you need to guard them safely because if your access token leaks while it's still active, someone else could use that access token to, to masquerade as you or to perform any of the uh, operations that you have authorized uh, with respect to that token. So it's very powerful, but what does it look like? And this is a question that comes up a lot from app developers who wanna uh, understand more about what that access token looks like and, and what it means. So if we look at the example in the, the Smart App Launch spec itself, uh, we come down to an example of a request that looks something like this, where the client passes along the code, the authorization code to the server, and it gets back this access token response. And in our example, uh, the access token itself is kind of inscrutable. It's just this sort of 20 digit string that looks like uh, somebody just sort of mashed on their keyboard. Uh, and the expectation here is, is actually, as far as the app is concerned, this is just some 
unguessable value. So some value with enough entropy and expressed as a JSON string. And that's all. It's an unguessable JSON string. The app developer doesn't get to peer into this and understand any details about it at all. We say that it's opaque because really the, the, the way the protocol is designed, the EHR knows what this means. And the app's job is to receive it in this response and use it as part of a header. So from the app's perspective, uh, once it gets this access token response, it can then do exactly one thing with that access token. When it wants to issue a request for clinical data, it puts it in the authorization header associated with that request. So that header looks like this example here, authorization space, uh, sorry, authorization colon, and then the value of the header is bearer space, and then the token itself. And as far as an app developer is concerned, that's the only way this token is used. It's used in authorization headers to associate a request with the authorization that's been granted. And there's no further details about the format. Um, so how does anybody understand what this means? How do people dig in and, and, and be sure that this access token is, um, is valid and know what it does? Well, the answer there differs uh, depending on what role we're talking about. So as an app developer, you expect that everything you need is part of this response. So the token itself, we've already said is opaque, but you do get information outside of the token, but as part of these sibling properties in the token response that tells you information about what that thing is and how it can be used. So of course, we've got a token type, and that's always, in this case, going to be bearer. If an app sees anything else, um, it should know that something has gone wrong. It's, it's not interacting with the smart app launch IG uh, as currently published. It gets an expiration time, which is a number of seconds uh, that that token is expected to be valid. And of course, things can always change. An access token that's supposed to be valid for an hour could always be invalidated sometime between now and then. But this is at least the, the sort of contract for communicating to the app what they should expect about the lifetime of a token. And then the app gets a list of scopes that have been approved with respect to that access token. So in this case, the scopes say that we're allowed to read uh, patient and observation resources associated with the patient in context. Uh, and that's what this prefix here means, is associated with the patient in context. But what is the patient in context? Uh, the app doesn't know this until it gets the access token response. Uh, and then it learns the patient in context through this uh, context parameter called patient. All these details are documented in the Smart App Launch IG, but sometimes it's useful to think about an example end to end to understand how these pieces fit together. Uh, and so it's really only at this point right here where the app gets this property, patient123, that's when the app knows that the ID of the patient whose records have been authorized with this token is 123. So then the app can take the details of this patient response and plot out its course of attack for writing queries uh, and fetching the data it's allowed to see from the fire server. It knows that it had better write these queries within the next uh, hour if it's going to be uh, allowed to complete them. And it knows that it should keep those queries focused to observation resources and to patient resources. And it knows that we should be focused on patient 123, so reading data about the clinical record of patient 123. Those are the kinds of constraints that the app developer learns about. And you don't learn about the constraints by inspecting this value. You learn about the constraints by inspecting all of the context parameters around this value, the sibling properties of the access token response. That's how an app developer learns what this token is good for. Now we should say that in different servers, very different decisions can be made about how to populate this value itself. There's a lot of ways to create an unguessable random string. Uh, so one approach, perfectly valid, is to literally, to have a server literally just create a random number with a certain amount of entropy, or a random string with a certain amount of entropy, and then take that number and store it off in a database somewhere in the server. So the server creates one of these things randomly, and the server keeps track of all the details about what it's allowed to do and stores those in the fields of its database. Uh, and that way, that, that database is the property of the server, uh, but it's often a shared database between the authorization server and uh, the fire resource server. So those two servers together know how to interpret these long random values. They just look them up in the shared database. That's one example of an approach that allows the two components of an EHR, so the fire server and the authorization server, those two components um, could interact that way based on a shared database. But there are other strategies as well that these two servers could use um, to interact. And I'll talk through a couple of them 
but I want to highlight the fact that as far as the smart app launch is concerned, this spec is entirely about how the app talks to the EHR. It's really about this interface. If that's what we try to standardize in smart. We don't try to standardize and we don't really put any constraints at all on how these pieces of the EHR work with each other. That's up to an EHR developer to decide uh, on the uh, conventions or mechanisms for their fire servers and their authorization servers uh, to work cohesively as a unit. So I gave the example of sharing a database and generating random IDs, perfectly valid, has some nice security properties, um, often used, but I, I said I would talk through a couple of other examples. And so let me, let me share one, uh, which is actually a, a technique that we use in some of our reference implementation for SMART. And so if we go to the SMART app launcher at launch.smarthealthit.org um, and just go through the exercise of launching a test app, I'm going to just launch this sample app down here so that we can see um, some simple details about how an app gets an access token response. Uh, so this sample app uh, is a nice one for showing off here because part of what it does as a developer tool is just to print out a bunch of the details of what data came over the wire. And so the first thing the app does is once it gets an access token is it just prints the entire access token response on the screen here. Now, normally you wouldn't put this information in front of a user because it's um, overwhelming, hard to interpret, and also might leak security details that you'd rather keep uh, outside of a user's hand, um, particularly for apps that run on the back end. Uh, but in this case, it's a browser-based app. Whole thing runs in the browser, all the data flow into the browser, and the sample app makes them visible here on the screen. So what's happening in the access token property of this access token response. Well, we can see it's a fairly long value, and I'm gonna scroll over to the right here to see sort of just how long it is, because I'm gonna copy this value. Uh, as a purely internal design choice, the Smart App Launcher doesn't generate random numbers here, doesn't generate random access tokens. Instead, the Smart App Launcher happens to create tokens that are um, in a format called JSON Web Tokens. And there's a set of tools that I can use to, to look at what uh, a JSON web token contains here at jwt.io. So there's kind of a debugger interface. So one thing I can do is paste a token into this debugger. I'll just paste that access token in here. And this is something that you shouldn't do with uh, real access tokens uh, because there's some risk of pasting a real access token into a live website. Uh, this website says that it's just going to work in my browser and that it's not going to send my data anywhere else. Uh, and for testing servers like the Smart App Launcher. No big deal because it's only got synthetic data anyway. But for real access tokens, you'd probably want to run a, a local inspection tool rather than relying on a website to look inside these things. So that's just a little security caveat. Uh, but this is good for testing infrastructure. So what does this token mean? Well, it's got two parts. Every JSON web token has a header and a payload. And I won't get into the details because I've already said this is a purely internal decision. This is just how the Smart App Launcher happens to construct its access tokens. And my app doesn't need to know any of these details. But, you know, we can peek under the hood if we want to. And actually, we can see that the payload of this token, this is a base64 encoded token uh, that's been signed by the EHR. And the payload of that token that's been signed is more or less the same as the access token response. It looks very similar to the access token response. So it has the same patient property and the same encounter property and the same refresh token and scopes and token type as the access token response. So this is kind of a neat trick. The smart app launcher puts all the details it needs into a single package. And instead of storing that package in a database somewhere, it signs that package and calls that whole thing the access token. And so then it returns that access token to the app and it says, treat this as a long random value and use it as a bearer token. Under the hood, yes, there is a structure. And technically, an app developer could look at that structure and learn some things, but it would be a programming mistake to rely on anything about this format. The, the contract between the app and the EHR just says, here's a long string you can use. And really, the only thing the app can do without violating that contract is to use it as the bearer token when it goes and issues API calls. Uh, so that's one very common strategy that allows the different components of an EHR to communicate with each other because even though the app isn't formally in on this convention, the two components of the EHR, the authorization server and the fire server, those components 
both agree on this convention, and they both know how to read and verify the signatures on this signed JSON web token. And so they don't need a shared database. They don't even need to send messages back and forth. They can just check the signatures and then use whatever values they see there, uh, as long as the signatures are done with a, a symmetrically shared secret. Uh, and there are other schemes that allow for asymmetric secrets as well. Um, so it's kind of a cool trick in that the two components that care about the access token format can agree on it. So the two pieces of the EHR, but the app itself, since it doesn't care, uh, doesn't ever need to know and doesn't ever need to look inside. So that's a very common approach for EHR authorization servers to communicate with EHR fire servers is just to agree on a token format. And there's one more approach to solving this problem that I want to highlight. Uh, and again, this is purely an EHR side decision. This is not uh, something that a client application really needs to know about. Uh, but the, the approach here is one that I'm going to call out because it's uh, recommended in the Smart App Launch spec. And it's actually been required by the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT as a feature that every authorization server needs to support. Uh, and that's a feature called OAuth Token Introspection. Uh, and I'm just going to mention this very briefly. We'll be developing more guidance on how to use token introspection uh, with SMART. But the idea here is this is a way that the authorization server can communicate to authorized uh, clients the meaning of an access token. So the link here is to a core specification from the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force. It's RFC 7662. Uh, and the basics of this spec are really an API definition that is extremely simple. Uh, let, me, let me search for this and see if I can find a copy that actually wants to register, uh, that actually wants to render uh, quickly. Otherwise, um, we can try to find a cached version of this page. Again, always the fun of doing a live demo. Let's try a cached version. All right, this one, this one finally rendered. So OAuth token introspection. The, the really quick insight here is token introspection defines one API uh, with one required input parameter, which is an access token. So a client can say, hey, here's this token. What does it mean? And the server responds back with some details. So this is an example where a client posts an access token to the server says, here's a, here's a token, what does it mean? And there's even a token type hint here, which is, hey, I think it's an access token if that helps you. And the server responds with some metadata about the token, very similar to what you might see in an access token response. So things like, is the token currently active? What client ID was the token issued for? What scopes are associated with this token? When is it set to expire? And so forth. And so this is a standard API that servers can support so that somebody can look up information about what a token currently means. So why is this useful? Well, the first thing to say is, as far as the smart protocol is concerned, most smart apps don't actually need this because at the time when the access token is issued, the smart app learns everything it needs to know and it can treat those things as true until the access token stops working. Um, so this isn't so much for smart apps, but it's uh, the real value of this token introspection approach is that it allows different kinds of servers on the EHR side to interact and form a network. So of course, if you have a, an API-like token introspection, this could provide a way for a resource server to learn from an authorization server what a token is good for. So this is a third way. We talked about random numbers on a shared database. We talked about signed JSON web tokens that are totally self-contained. And this is a third way, a live API that the resource server can call anytime it sees a token and it can learn what that token is currently good for. And the cool thing about that is it allows new resource servers to be introduced into the ecosystem much more easily because there's this loose coupling. Any resource server can go back to the authorization server, even if they haven't been built by the same team, even if they don't agree on a lot of the technical details about token formats, the resource server can say, hey, somebody just tried to get some resources and they gave me this access token. What's the token good for? And then depending on what scopes and depending on the, access, uh, the active status of the token, the resource server can either uh, return data or return an authorization error. So that's a quick view into the access token formats used in Smart on Fire. As a review, the access token format itself is opaque to the app, but servers have a few different techniques that they can use uh, in order to communicate between resource servers and authorization servers what the meaning of any particular token is at any point in time. So hope that's been a useful way to disambiguate one of these frequently asked questions. 
and we'll check in again soon for the next installment of A Guided Tour Through Fire.